Prior to Passover, uh, we spend uh, much time studying God's Word uh, with the express purpose of, of gleaning uh, lessons that help us as we examine ourselves as we are instructed to do prior to Passover. And uh, with that in mind, there is a historical account in the Bible that provides much for us to learn and apply to ourselves in this process of self-examination. And this example gives us much encouragement in these very dark days because there's some analogies between the dark days that we're going to look at in the book of Judges and certain things that are going on today. Because back then, sinister forces were exerting control, and uh, obviously Satan does not rest, and those forces continue to attempt to exert control. So today, what we're going to do is look at the life of one of the 11 judges of Israel. And this judge is a woman that appears out of nowhere, who is the only female judge, and her name is Deborah. And in the same account, there is another woman who was also a heroine in the account, uh, and she arrived on the scene later, and we'll, we'll uh, talk about her in a bit. But Deborah, like Moses before, and like David after, fulfilled the roles of judge, of a national leader, of a poet, and of a songwriter. And two chapters of the Bible are devoted to her. And the events described in these two chapters are thought to have occurred around, you know, in the 1100s B.C. And those two chapters are Judges 4 and 5. And so you can be turning to Judges 4 <clears throat> as a start. But these two chapters uh, chronicle a 60-year slice of biblical history. And these two chapters are very unusual because the first chapter is a narration of an account that happened. That's Judges chapter 4. And then the second chapter is, a, is poetry and song. That's Judges chapter 5. And in fact, Judges chapter 5 is the oldest known poem in the Bible. And these two chapters, they complement each other. And they, they, if you put the two together, then you fit the details and the insights together uh, by putting the com you get the complete story by putting the two chapters together. Uh, it is thought that Deborah uh, led Israel for approximately 60 years, uh, 20 years before the Canaanite War, and 40 peaceful years after. So two chapters, 60 years. And uh, there is no record, absolutely no record in history or in the Bible of any opposition or rebellion against Deborah for being a female judge. Rather, she appears to be highly respected. So if you, if you want a title for today, it's uh, Lessons from the Life of Deborah. There's four lessons. But what we're going to do first is look at the account in Judges 4 and 5 and put those two accounts together and go through the account. And then we will uh, glean the four lessons that we can learn today that might help us as we prepare for Passover. So first we need to get some uh, background of the time. Joshua died a couple of hundred years earlier. And Israel is in a familiar pattern that we all know about. Yehovah re, uh, removed, withdrew his blessings over Israel because of their disobedience. And then Israel becomes oppressed as a result of that disobedience. And there is a king named Jabin, J-A-B-I-N. He is the king of the Canaanites. And he reigned from a town named Hazor in the northern part of Israel. 
125 miles north of Jerusalem, about 10 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. He reigned in the area of the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun, again, in northern Israel. Now, Josephus, in the, I've got the 1960 edition of his writings, states that the, Jabin, the king of the Canaanites, had 300,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 horsemen, and 3,000 chariots. And he had conquered Israel 20 years earlier and ordered them to pay tribute to him. And so now that's the background as we come to Judges chapter 4 and verse 1. And you probably want to place a marker because we'll be moving around a little bit. Judges chapter 4 and verse 1. So here we are. And the children of Israel did again did evil in the sight of Jehovah when Ehud was dead. Verse 2, And Jehovah sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, and he will play a role here in just a moment, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. Now Sisera, um, his, his headquarters was 45 miles southwest of Jabin, in Hazor. He was near the coast. He was to the south and the west. Verse 3, And the children of Israel cried unto Jehovah, for he, Jabin, had 900 chariots of iron, and, and for 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So Josephus and, and the Bible uh, disagree here. Josephus said, said he had many more chariots than that, but it could be that his other chariots were deployed somewhere else. And so at least 900 chariots faced the Israelites. Now uh, go across the page into the next chapter, Judges 5 and verse 6, and I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. In the days of Shagmar, son of Anath, uh, Shagmar is mentioned in chapter 3 and verse 31, uh, Shagmar killed 600 Philistines. So in the days of Shagmar, and in the days of Yael, it's J-A-E-L, it's pronounced Yael, in the days of Yael, she is a contemporary of Deborah, and we're going to see the account of her in just a minute. So in the days of, of Deborah and Yael, people avoided the main roads, and travelers stayed on crooked side paths. Verse 7, there were few people left in the villages of Israel until Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. So we see how oppressed Israel had become because God Almighty withdrew his blessings and they suffered as a result. Now the Hebrew word for mother is interesting here. It is Strong's 517. It's the Hebrew word E-M. It's pronounced Ame. And it means a mother, but notice this, a mother as the bond of the family. Now, when you apply that to Deborah and her role, it tells us that she was the bond that held the nation of Israel together, as a mother would be the bond of a, of a family. Going on in verse 8 here in Judges 5, I'll read this out of the New International Version. And when they, referring to Israel, chose new gods, in other words, they rejected God Almighty, then guess what happened? War came to the city gates, and not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. So this tells us that Israel was not armed for war. They had no chariots. Uh, they had no shields and no spears. They probably had short swords. Maybe had some bows and arrows, but certainly had no power against an army with 900 chariots and horsemen and foot soldiers that greatly outnumbered the Israelites. So let's go back now to Judges 4 and verse 4, where we left off. Judges 4 and verse 4. And it says, And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. 
Now, names are important to God Almighty, as we know. The patriarchs' names had meaning. The 12 sons of Jacob, their names had meaning. Down through biblical history, people's names are significant, and they have meaning. And the Hebrew word for Deborah is very interesting when you look it up. It's strong 1683, and you wouldn't have thought of this, or cert I certainly didn't, but Deborah means the bee, as in a buzzing bee. But it has a specific meaning. The bee in the sense of orderly motion and its systematic instincts. So if we put that and apply that to Deborah, we could probably conclude that she was organized, she was deliberate, and she was active. You know, bees don't sit still. They're moving all the time. Now, the Jewish Encyclopedia under Deborah, uh, page 489, says this, quote, Wife of Lapidoth could also be translated woman of torches or woman of flame. And it goes on to note that the rabbinic tradition notes that Deborah was a great light in Israel, a woman of torches. That, that she was, amid a persecuted people, she was a great light and a great influence over the nation. Verse 5, she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. Now, this is uh, just 10 miles north of Jerusalem. It's about 100 miles south of where King, King Jabin reigned. And it goes on to say here in verse 5, And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now, given the fact that she was in Ephraim, it indicates she probably was an Ephraimite, where, in the area where she lived. And the Israelites came to see her under her palm tree, which is akin to later on where it's described as, as a, a judge or a prophet sitting at the city gates. They would come to the city gates and have consultation. Well, in this case, they came to Deborah and sat under a palm tree on her property. Going on in verse 6, And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, uh, out of Kedesh Naphtali. Now, Kedesh Naphtali is about 10 miles north of where Jabin, the Canaanite king, lived. It's north of the Sea of Galilee. So he's all the way up at the top of Israel. Now, the Hebrew name for Barak means lightning or a flashing sword. Now, nothing is known about Barak, but given his name, I think we can assume that he was a man of some fighting ability, had that background. Going on in verse 6, And Deborah said unto him, Has not Jehovah, God of Israel, commanded, saying, now he commanded her, she's the prophetess, she is in communication with God Almighty, has not Jehovah, God of Israel, commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun. So here, Deborah is asking this man, Barak, to raise an army and to be the general in command of the army. Now, in addition to that, and you don't need to turn there, but you can use it as a reference, in chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, that also tells us during the song uh, that Deborah and Barak song, uh, sung, that Ephraim, Benjamin, and Issachar also joined this army in addition to uh, Naphtali, in addition to Zebulun. Now in verse 7, Deborah now quotes Yehovah. God Almighty spoke this to her. And I, referring to Yehovah, will draw unto you, will draw you to the river Kishon, Sisera. We, he was the captain of the hosts, the captain of Javan's army, with his chariots and his multitude. Yehovah says, and I will deliver him into your Deborah's hand. 
And Barak said unto her, she's telling Barak this, and Barak's response in verse 8, he says, If you will go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I'm not going to go. So Barak obviously has great respect for her because he knows she is close to Yehovah. And he's not about to go on this undertaking if she's not there with him, you know, as we could say, taking her back or backing him up. And they do make a good team because her closeness to Yehovah as a prophetess is combined with his military prowess, apparently, that he had. And so in that sense, they make a good team together. Going on in verse 9, <clears throat> and she said, I will surely go up with you, but notice this caution, notwithstanding the journey that you take shall not be for your honor. For Yehovah shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. This is not to glorify you, she said. Now, the New Living Translation, I'm going to quote three other translations just to get the sense of, of this verse. The NLT says, Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for Yehovah's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. The New American Standard Bible says, quote, she said, I will certainly go with you, however, the fame shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take, for Yehovah will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And then finally, the Aramaic Bible in plain English says this, quote, She said to him, Certainly I'm going with you, however, Barak, you shall not boast on the road that you are traveling, because the Lord Yehovah shall deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So she had this caution, this warning. And, and you know, is, did Barak maybe have a, a problem with pride or a problem with being boastful? We don't know, but here's this warning, and she's putting him on notice. Hey, this isn't for your glory. It's for the glory of Yehovah, and he's going to deliver a, an army into the hands of a woman. Uh, going on in the second half of verse 9. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. This is uh, Barak's hometown, 10 miles north of Azor. So this is a, a, a relatively long journey, 130 miles north. And they're 10 miles north of where uh, Jabin the king, Canaanite king lived. Verse 10. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went with him. Now, the term at his feet implies that the men of the army were willingly submissive to his command and to his leadership, and he must have had their respect, because if somebody is at your feet, they are submissive to you. So everybody was on board with Barak's leadership, and I assume as long as Deborah was by his side. Now in verse 11, we have a change of focus. There's, a, there's another player coming in here. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses... Now, this, by most accounts, is a mistranslation, father-in-law. Clark's commentary says the son-in-law, which is more appropriate, uh, because we know who the father-in-law of Moses is. So we see here that Heber the Kenite, which was the son-in-law of the children of Ohab, uh, Hobab, the son-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites, his tribe, his clan, and pitched his tent in the plain of Zanam, which is by Kedesh, which is not far away. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. So Heber now was playing the role of a spy. 
And he was telling Jabin the king, look, you got this Israelite army going up to Mount Tabor, which is about 20 miles away. And Mount Tabor is about 2,000 feet uh, above the valley floor. So it's, it's a quite high promontory. So from a military standpoint, it has a wonderful advantage. You can see all around uh, and uh, you can muster your forces better. But we see here that this man Heber was a traitor and a spy. Verse 13, And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him, from Herosheth of the Gentiles, unto the river Kishon. So as we've said, the Israelite army was far outclassed. They had no chariots. And the fact is... Uh, History tells us that Sisera's chariots were armed with scythes. I think we all know what a scythe is. You cut wheat with a scythe. It's a scythe. It's a curved blade that is several feet long. And what he had done was attached scythes to the axles of the chariot so that the scythes were out horizontal, parallel to the ground, on each side, three or four feet to, the, to each side of the wheels, the axles. And the strategy was, is the charioteer would just drive the chariot right through an army, a standing army, and cut them off at the knees. So they would be driven into the path of foot soldiers. Now what happens here is Sisera concentrates his forces near the river Kishon. And the river Kishon in those days and at that time of year was more like what is called a wadi. It's a, a wadi is a river channel that is flat and broad, but it's dry, except during the rainy season. And so, being flat and broad, it's a good place to muster your forces. And so, Sisera gathered his forces together at the base of Mount Tabor in this flat area, the wadi of the river Kishon. Verse 14, And Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is, the, this is the day in which Yehovah has delivered Sisera into your hand. Is not Yehovah gone out before you? She tells Barak. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Now verse 15, beginning of verse 15, I'll read out of the New Living Translation. And when Barak attacked, Yehovah threw Sisera and all his charioteers and warriors into a panic. Now, what happened? How did God Almighty do that? Well, look at Judges chapter 5 and verse 4. Judges chapter 5 and verse 4. This is part of the poem, part of the song that uh, Deborah and Barak sing. Judges 5 verse 4. Yehovah, when you went out of Seir... When you marched out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Notice this, the clouds also dropped water. Now, go to verse 21. I'll read this out of the King James, New King James. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, O oh my soul, March on in strength. So what happened is Sisera concentrated his forces at the foot of Mount Tabor and uh, in the wadi of Kishon. And Barak's army hid in the woods that existed at that time on the sides of Mount Tabor. And Yehovah, God Almighty, caused a mighty rain. And you can imagine if a, if a downpour, like we were describing the floods in Australia, if a downpour came on the top of the mountain or the upper parts of the mountain, that water would come rushing right down the sides of the mountain into that wadi and uh, inundate the troops and turn the riverbed, the valley floor, into mud. And then the chariots become immobilized, causing panic among the soldiers. And Barak's army came out of hiding in the, in probably from the, the woods in the, surrounding the mountain and slaughtered the Canaanites. But 
it was done by the power of Yehovah. He caused it all. He gave them strength. He turned the, the soldiers of Jabin into a panic, and they were slaughtered. And any dreams that Jabin and Sisera had of using all of their chariots, the 3,000 chariots, uh, to defeat Egypt and become a world power, literally got stuck in the mud uh, at the bottom of Mount Tabor when Yehovah sent the rain. So let's go back now to Judges chapter 4 and verse, the second part of verse 15. Because the slaughter is, is occurring, uh, Sisera now knows he is being defeated, and guess what? He turns and runs. He wants to save himself. Judges 4 verse 15, Then Sisera leapt down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Verse 16, Barak chased the army and their chariots all the way to Herosheth Hoigiam, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. The entire army of 30,000 was destroyed by an Israelite army of 10,000 due to the power of God Almighty. Okay, well, what about the army's leader, Sisera? Verse 17, Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Yael, this woman that we talked about in the introduction, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, the spy and the traitor. She's his wife. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Azor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And then Yael, and again, remember, uh, names mean something to God Almighty. The Hebrew word for Yael means wild goat. And we're going to see that's an appropriate name for this woman. Wild goat. So Yael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, and, and don't be afraid. So when he turned into her in, and came into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said to her, Give me, I pray you, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man comes to inquire of you and say, Is there a man here? You shall say, No. Now he trusted her because her husband was Jabin's ally, his boss's ally, so he had full trust in her. He had no reason to doubt her, that she wouldn't comply. Verse 21, Then Yael's Heber's wife took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand, and went softly into him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fasted it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Now think about that just for a minute. Here you have the, the commander of a, of a foreign army, a man of renown, obviously strong, and uh, military prowess comes in and give her orders. Now he's tired, he's on the run, so he conks out on the floor of the tent. Well, to drive something through this temple and out this temple and put it into the ground has got to be something, you know, longer than a foot. And she creeps in with this, we would call it today a tent peg. She creeps in with this and a hammer. Don't know what the hammer was made of, probably had a stone head. And she held it there, and she hit one, he probably took one or two blows to put it right through his head into the ground, killed him instantly. But that took some powerful blows, and it took courage, and it took strength. And this was a woman to be reckoned with. Verse 22, And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Yael came out to meet him and said to him, Come. I'll show you the man that you're seeking. And when he came into the tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. Death comes uh, to an Israelite enemy at the hands of a woman, courageous woman. Yeah, she murders a man. She commits murder. 
But Yehovah commanded the slaughter of the army, and she was just an instrument in his hands. And this uh, is commemorated by a famous Italian painting by Gentileschi, I think I'm pronouncing it right, in 1620. And it shows the whole scene, and she's there with a hammer, you know, above the tent peg, and he's sleeping there on his side. It's a very graphic uh, painting, but done in the Renaissance style, you know, and it's just uh, a gorgeous painting, but, you know, very uh, uh, dark in its intent. So the fact is, is that Yehovah blessed her because of her courage and her determination to do His will. Now notice chapter, Judges 5 and verse 34. Judges, and this is the song, this is the poem. Judges 5 verse 34. Blessed above women shall Yael the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be among, above women in the tent. Now this, if you recall, this is a very similar praise that goes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke chapter 2. Blessed are you above women. Same kind of praise for this very uh, strong woman who killed the commander of the Canaanite army. Now back to Judges chapter 4 and verse 23. Judges 4 and verse 23. Summarizing now. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. Verse 24, I'll read out of the NIV. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. Now, Josephus says in, in this 1960 edition, states that, that um, Barak overtook uh, Jabin in Hazor, where he lived. He killed him, and he took the city of Hazor down to its foundations. Just completely turned it into rubble. So that was the end of King Jabin, who had oppressed Israel for 20 years. Now what happens is Deborah and Barak praise God Almighty, Yehovah, for what he did. Let's go to Judges chapter 5 now in verse 1. This is the beginning of the poem, the song. Judges 5 and verse 1. Then sang Deborah and Barak, this is after Jabin is dead, after Sisera is dead, after Azor is leveled. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise you, Yehovah, for avenging the avenging of Israel. When the people <clears throat> willingly offered themselves in volunteering for this army, Hear, O you kings, give ear, O you princes, I, even I, will sing to Yehovah. I will sing praises to Yehovah, God of Israel. Now, verse 4, I will read out of the New Living Translation. <coughs> Yehovah, when you set out from Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled and the cloudy skies poured down rain. We read that earlier, denoting the the flood that was created by God Almighty. Verse 5, the mountains quaked at the coming of Yehovah. Even Mount Sinai shook in the presence of Yehovah, the God of Israel. Now, verse 31, Yehovah, may all your enemies die as Sisera did. But may those who love you rise like the sun at full strength. Isn't that an interesting turn of phrase? Rise like the sun at full strength? I mean, this is metaphorical, sure, but when God's people rise in the resurrection, will they not be spirit beings, probably shining in ways that we cannot imagine? Then going on, then there was peace in the land for 40 
years under Deborah's reign. Now, <clears throat> what a story. You know, we can read right over it or it gets lost in the Bible. We don't think about Deborah. But what a story of, of God Almighty delivering his people at the hands of a woman. And as we approach Passover, you know, it's time for our, we self-evaluate, we fast, we look at our conduct over the last year, and we look for examples in our Father's Word for help in evaluating ourselves to help us in this process. So let's ask the question now, what lessons can we learn from the example of Deborah that help us look at ourselves, learn what we need to learn, and go forward closer to God Almighty? So we're going to look at four lessons today. The first one, the most obvious, is that Yehovah used a woman to accomplish great things. What a concept. Deborah fulfilled the role, as we said before, of judge, national leader, poet, and songwriter. And Yehovah used several women as prophets before. We won't go through the accounts, but Moses' sister Miriam was uh, called a prophet in Exodus chapter 15. There was a woman named Huldah who was a prophetess uh, in 2 Kings chapter 22. And then if you remember in Luke chapter 2, Anna was a prophetess who lived at the temple, quite famous. And then, of course, uh, God Almighty used Ruth to save Israel from extermination. We know that account. <clears throat> and so the fact is, when you, when you think about it, in our Father's eyes, all humans, all His children are equal. That, ha that, that concept of, of, of all God's creation, His children, uh, you know, Gordon pointed out rightly so in the, ser in the sermonette that, you know, these, there's some evil people out there. There's some bad folks out there. But we need to love them and pray for them because they are indeed children of God. They aren't called yet. They will have their time. But in, in the Father's eyes, all humans are equal. And that was something that had to be pounded into the heads of the Jews in the early New Testament times because they thought they were above everyone because they had this special relationship with God and everybody else, the Gentiles, were unclean. You couldn't even touch them. Or the Pharisees, if you touch, if your sleeve came up against a Gentile, you had to go home and wash in their view. Let's go to Acts chapter 10 and look at verse 34, just one verse that gives us this principle. <clears throat> and something when their situations go on in the world today, we need to keep in mind. Acts 10 and verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth, but notice what he said. Of a truth, Peter says, of a truth. Peter of Acts 10 verse 34 of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. It is true. We don't have any special uh, light shining on us because He's called us here in the 21st century, and we're part of the first fruits. Uh, that is quite an honor, but it doesn't make us special in any way. Now go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Here Paul grew up in the most strict rabbinic tradition, uh, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And uh, I'm sure at some point he thought he was pretty special, growing up at the feet of Gamaliel, having this training and this education. Galatians 3 and verse 28, Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free slave or free. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. 
We are all equal as our Father's children in our opportunity for salvation. We don't have any, God Almighty doesn't have any second class citizens as far as opportunity for salvation. Once they're called, we all have that equal opportunity. Now, it is true that men and women have been given by God different roles. Yehovah has given us different roles, especially in marriage and also within the church itself. They are roles, but that doesn't mean one is superior to another. It doesn't mean one has a leg up on the kingdom over the other. It doesn't mean that at all. And it doesn't mean that women cannot be accomplished, as we just read in the account of Deborah. This is a big lesson. Women can do great things. That's our, the point we're on. Women, it, it doesn't mean that women can't be successful, that what a woman puts her hand to do, she can't do. No, of course not. For time's sake, you know, we could go through Proverbs 31. We're all familiar with the Proverbs 31 wife. But in summary, what does she do? Well, she runs the household. She runs it. She buys property. She spends money. She sells products that she has made. She looks after the poor and the needy. And she has freedom to, to do that. And as a result, her husband is... is I say proud in the right sense. He, um, not that he's puffing himself up, but he looks very favorably upon his wife because of her skills and what she has done. And in that regard, women can be very capable. Let me give you a personal example <clears throat> of a woman, Dorothy and I know, she is not in the church, but when we had our own business 20 years ago, we you know, we had no savings. We invested everything we had into this business. And, uh, uh, you know, if it had failed, we, we would have been out on the street. But, uh, you know, after a few years, it became apparent we, we've got to put some money aside for uh, retirement because we had zero. And so we invested in a, in a condominium in Victoria, British Columbia. It was just a favorite place of ours. And there was uh, a condominium that we, we liked, and we were able to do so that at that time, this is 20 years ago, there was a 40% exchange rate bonus. In other words, uh, 60 U.S. pennies would buy you a dollar Canadian. So in essence, everything you bought in Canada had a 40% discount. And that's the only reason we could afford that. So, the, the, you know, the, after the building was built and, and we got moved in and we used it to, to go up there, we would go up there, you know, four or six times a year and stay for a week or two. But uh, the, the condo complex had a, what they call in Canada, concierge. And, and she was, it could be a man or a woman, but the concierge was a woman. And uh, she basically ran the building and, and uh, looked after the building and looked after the people in the building. And she was hired and supervised by the condominium board as, a, as basically a caretaker. And if you had a problem, you went to her. And so she had to please the tenants because the condominium board made up of tenants hired her. And yet she had to enforce the condominium rules. And there were rules that there were certain things you couldn't do. And, uh, and, you know, smoke in public places or hose down your patio and spray water all over your neighbors and, you know, things like that. And so she had to enforce the, con uh, the condo rules when a tenant, br uh, tenant broke them, but she also had to please the tenant. So this is a very fine line this woman had to walk. She was in a unique position because she had power over the tenants and yet a responsibility to them at the same time. Not an easy job. Not an easy job. Very difficult to manage properly. And uh, I personally uh, learned a lot from her leadership because it, it, she had a desk right in the front, walked in the front door, she was right there, always right there. When you had a problem, she'd answer the phone. Well, I learned a lot about her leadership because she was pleasant at all times. 
But when a rule was broken, there was a serious unbending side to this woman. And uh, she was dedicated to correcting the problem. Don't get in her way in correcting a problem. <laughs> Dorothy and I would always, there was a television show years ago and about a man who had a wife, and he referred to his wife as she who must be obeyed. <laughs> and and we, we talked about, uh, the concierge was named Evelyn, and we talked about Evelyn as she who must be obeyed, because you get crosswise with Evelyn and, you, and you're in the wrong, uh, you knew it. But then after the correction, or after the problem was solved, everything returned to normal. She was just as friendly as can be, and as motherly as she could be, and as nice as she could be. There was nothing personal about it, and the tenants loved her and respected her. And, uh, and uh, she was a mother and a leader at the same time. And when she uh, retired, they, everybody chipped in, gave her a big party and a, I can't remember, a, a vacation, a weekend or something, a week or so at some place. And she was a perfect example of being a motherly person and a leader. I remember Clint Eastwood, the famous uh, award-winning actor and director. He's 91 years old now. He said, quote, if you take your work seriously and not yourself seriously, you will do well the rest of your life. Deborah did that. This concierge named Evelyn uh, did that. And the point I'm making is that as, as our father's children, both men and women have equal value in our father's sight and in his eyes. Let's go to 1 Peter 3 and uh, verse 7. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. <clears throat> Peter's talking about husbands and wives. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, New Living Translation. First Peter 3, verse 7, he says, In the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. And he's obviously referring to physical strength. But she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. She has the same opportunity, the same uh, chance to be in God's kingdom. Going on, if you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. That is a scary thought for men. So we see here that women have equal opportunity to be in the kingdom of God. And a physical woman can shine just as brightly in the kingdom of God, once she is changed, just as brightly as a man in the kingdom of God. And that is a huge lesson that frankly, women need to learn and men need to learn. And the life of Deborah proves this account, and it should be an encouragement to all women. Notice Proverbs 31 and verse 30. This is a warning from Solomon. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. Proverbs 31 and verse 30. Notice what he says. I wish young women today, uh, especially the ones you see out flaunting themselves, would read this. Proverbs 31, verse 30. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears Yehovah will be greatly praised, now and in the kingdom of God. So what great things can a, can a godly woman accomplish today, you know? Uh, what, what can she attain? Well, the most obvious one is, hey, I can attain eternal life. I mean, what greater gift is that? 
I have every opportunity. I am not a second-class citizen in attaining eternal life. That's a huge one. But then the second is a woman can accomplish a great deal by setting a godly example for all of those within her sphere of influence. All of those she comes in contact with. Family, friends, neighbors, job, acquaintances. It doesn't make any difference. Let's go to Matthew 5 and verse 14 and look at a very familiar scripture. But look at it from the standpoint of a woman accomplishing great things, as Deborah did in this first point. Matthew 5 and verse 14. <clears throat> Christ says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hid. And what he's saying is, look, you set an example whether you want to or not. And I've heard people say, especially women, well, I don't want to set an example. I don't want to be up there, you know, with a light on me. But the light's on you whether you like it or not. And we set an example whether we want to or not. Verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. You can't hide it. Therefore, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This scripture applies to both men and women. Examples can be set. They are set every day. The question is, is my example a godly one or is it a, a carnal one? Now let's go to 1 Peter 3 and verse 1. 1 Peter 3 and verse 1. Peter again is, is talking about uh, men and women. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. <clears throat> 1 Peter 3, verse 1. In the same way, Peter says, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Even those, referring to husbands, who refuse to accept the good news, meaning even those who are not converted, not baptized, not called. Your godly, your godly lives will speak to them better than any words. They will be won over, verse 2, by watching your pure, godly behavior. Verse 3, don't be concerned about the outward beauty that depends on fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. Verse 4, you should be known for the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. A woman who has a gentle and a quiet spirit is to be admired. A brash, haughty, loud, crude woman is not. And that's true for men too. There's an old saying, your example is shouting so loud I can't hear what you're saying. That is so true. And women can set this Gentle, quiet example for all to see. I think the best example that I've seen was uh, Herbert Armstrong's wife, Loma. Because she was always in the background. But when Loma spoke to Herbert Armstrong, he listened. He did indeed listen. And she was very influential in making up for his lack. Because he, he didn't have that that female sense of judging a person's inner character. And he would sometimes just listen to people as to what they said and not evaluate, okay, what's the motive here? What's the agenda? Uh, is somebody trying to pull the wool over me? And Loma, by many accounts, would just quietly whisper in his ear, be careful here. Watch out for this person and give him quiet, gentle advice. And when she died, much was lost in that regard. When she died, things went south. 
And that shows you how, what a great contribution uh, she made to the church and to her husband. So women have an, a unique opportunity to influence the behavior of others. And, they, and, and it is done in a godly way, in a meek and a quiet way. Okay, the second point is Deborah knew that God Almighty would fight her battles. As a woman, she knew she didn't have great physical strength. I mean, she had no background in, in, in military matters that we know of. But she knew of a principle that was very important. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. This was the principle that Deborah relied upon during this whole 60-year period, and especially during the Canaanite War. Zechariah 4 and verse 6. An angel is speaking to Zechariah. Zechariah 4 verse 6, second to the last uh, book in the Old Testament. Then he, Zechariah 4 verse 6, referring to the angel, answered and spoke unto me, Zechariah, saying, This is the word of Jehovah unto Zerubbabel, saying, and here is the principle, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Jehovah of hosts. This is the principle, and Deborah knew this. Remember, uh, we won't turn there, but in Judges chapter 4, remember Deborah said to Barak, uh, Yehovah is going to deliver you this day, and he's going out before you, and he's going to rout Sisera, but you better not brag about it. You better not take credit for it, because she knew it was by God's Spirit. Let's go to uh, Judges chapter 5 and verse 4. We read part of that before. <clears throat> Notice the credit that God Almighty gets and that, that He is the one. Judges 5, verse 4. I'll read this out of the NLT. Deborah wrote this and sang this. Yehovah, when you set out from Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled and the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked at the coming of Yehovah. Even Mount Sinai shook in the presence of Yehovah, the God of Israel. Verse 19, I'll read this out of the NIV. Kings came, they fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, and they carried off no silver, no plunder. From the heavens the stars fought, from their courses they fought against Sisera. Angels from Yehovah carried the day. It wasn't man's might. It wasn't a general's uh, brilliance or wisdom. It was spiritual forces that carried the day. And she knew that, and she knew God Almighty would fight the battle. She didn't have to worry. And today, you see, our Father fights our battles. We cannot forget that in these dark days that we're entering. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> and we'll begin in verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Read this out of the NIV. Very familiar scripture, but let's apply it to today and what's happening in this world today. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power, notice this, the way the NIV phrases it, of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. And this is so true with what's going on in Europe today. Verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so when that day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after have done everything to stand. 
Now let's look at a principle for all time in Psalm 91, and we'll begin in verse 9. This is a principle that applies whenever we face opposition, whenever we need rescuing. And I've read this so many times over the years when we, we have, as a church or as individuals, we need to be rescued by God Almighty. Psalm 91, verse 9. A principle of all time. Because you have made Yehovah, which is my refuge, even the Most High. Yehovah is indeed the Most High. That tells you it has to be God Almighty, God the Father. Because you have made the Most High your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Just as he did with Deborah and Barak, and we just read about the angelic forces that were involved. Verse 12, they, referring to his angels, shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shall you trample under feet. Because he, and we can insert our own names here, because he or she has set his love upon me, we've set our love upon God Almighty, therefore will I deliver them, because we love God with all our being and put him first. The result, I will set him on high. Why? Because he has known my name. Isn't that interesting? And his name is Jehovah. The Bible says that clearly. And we proclaim that at every opportunity. We never want to deny God Almighty's name. Verse 15, He shall call upon me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him or her. Verse 16, With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is a principle for all time. And this is a lesson for us in this very troubled, very dark, very dangerous world. And as Deborah did, uh, we can look to our Father to fight our battles be they physical or be they spiritual. Now let's go to the third point. Deborah gave Yehovah all the credit. In these two chapters, she never exalted herself. Deborah gave Yehovah all the credit. She never used her God-given position as prophetess to exalt the self. And remember, she... Uh, warned Barak to do the same thing in chapter 4 and verse 9. He says, you know, this is not for your honor because God Almighty is going to sell Jabin and Sisera into the hands of a woman. And so she gave God all the credit. And we should always do the same thing and follow Deborah's example. It's easy to forget our father's involvement. Uh, sometimes in the update, um, I will get an urgent prayer request, and, and, and it just, you know, you've got to get something out, but, you know, this is happening, or that's happening, or my child's sick, or somebody's on the way to the hospital, or whatever it might be. And then our Father intervenes, and someone is rescued, someone is healed, someone is, is taken care of, but then the phone goes silent. And so I have to call back and say, okay, well, what happened over here? Or, you know, what, tell me what, what went, oh, well, well you know, they're, they're fine. Okay, well, how did that happen? You see, it's easy to, once the crisis is over, is to move on to the next event in our life and not stop and think, maybe we ought to praise God Almighty and look back at His hand in it and see that He pulled our fanny out of the fire he rescued us, and maybe we ought to give him credit openly in front of everybody. It's easy to give credit to a pill or a procedure. 
and then move on to the next event and forget giving Yehovah all the credit. Let's go to Daniel 6 and verse 25 and see a remarkable event of a pagan king doing what we should be doing. Daniel 6 and verse 25. We're breaking into the account of uh, after Yehovah rescued Daniel from the lions. Daniel 6 and verse 25. And we're told, Daniel 6 verse 25, And then King Darius wrote unto all people, I mean, this wasn't a memo to be passed around the office. He wrote to all people, nations, languages that dwell on all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you, he says. Verse 26 of Daniel 6. I make a decree that in every dominion of my king, my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Now, why would he say that? For he is the living God. That is Yehovah. That is God the Father. That's what the Bible tells us. He is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Verse 27, he, now this pagan king is saying, he, Yehovah, delivers and rescues. And he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? And here is a pagan king taking the time to write a letter to every province, every dominion, to the far ends of his kingdom, giving God Almighty the credit for rescuing somebody he threw to the lions. Now think about that. If we take credit or give credit to other things, why should our Father continue to answer our prayers and deliver us if He's done it before and we never gave Him any credit or any thanks or we didn't acknowledge it to the whole the people in our sphere of influence? As with Deborah, and you read Judges chapter 5, she gave God Almighty, the honor and the glory and the credit for what He did for her, and we should do likewise for all of our blessings. Okay, fourth point, last point. The obvious point, but one that we need to remember and apply today, is our Father answers our prayers for rescue. Remember, Israel cried to God. And during the days of Deborah, 20 years of persecution... And our Father, their God, answered them. After sinning and being oppressed, in Judges chapter 4, verse 3, we read it, He answered. And, but the fact is, and this is something we should learn, He answered in a way they did not expect. Because He rescued Israel at the hands of a woman, which they never expected. You would ask them, how's God going to do this? Last thing we were thought about is, uh, I'm going to take a woman and I'm going to cause her to be my instrument to rescue you disobedient Israelites. But that's what he did. And similarly, you see, our Father hears our prayers. And uh, he, it's been my experience. He often does not answer exactly the way I would like it to happen. But it is a marvelous, miraculous answer that's better than what I wanted in the first place. Let's go to Proverbs 15 and verse 29. <clears throat> Proverbs 15 and verse 29. This is a principle as we approach the Passover, we need to deeply think about. Just one verse. Proverbs 15 and verse 29. Yehovah is far from the wicked. That's a principle. If we sin, we move away from God Almighty. And if we are wicked, meaning that's our intent, we are a long way away from God. But the, the antithesis of that is 
but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And so as we approach Passover, our job is to become more righteous every day, to draw near to God Almighty every day. Let's go back to Psalm 73 and just read one verse, verse 28. Psalm 73 and verse 28. The psalmist here makes a, a, a very critical statement. Psalm 73 and verse 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. That is a good thing. I have put my trust in the Lord Yehovah that I may declare all your works. You see, in these very dark, very dangerous days, as we have learned with Deborah, we must put our trust in God Almighty. He is our only hope. He and His Son and what they have done for us is our only hope for rescue and deliverance during these dark days. It is only through them will we be rescued. And we learn that lesson from Deborah. Because she kept saying, look, Yehovah did it. Not you, Barak. Not me. God Almighty did it. And he answers our prayers. And one thing we can be assured of, we won't turn there, but Romans 8 and verse 28, we quote that so often, is that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. That's us. And so we have absolute confidence that if we put our trust in Him, everything will work out for good. This is a promise that we, as with Deborah, can count on. Our Father answers our prayers for rescue. Now let's conclude. <clears throat> Everything in the Bible is for a reason. It's there for a reason. It's not by accident. It's not by whim. It is there for a purpose. And these two chapters of Deborah are there and are included because our Father wants us to learn something. So as we approach Passover in incredibly dangerous times, and between now and the Passover, who knows what's going to happen between now and then, we all need encouragement. And the story of Deborah is just that. It's a story of a nation oppressed, a nation subjugated. People weren't even walking on the roads. The villages were empty. Kind of Reminds you of Ukraine right now. And, uh, but the people in, in, in Judges chapter 4 were calling out to Yehovah for deliverance. They finally got the message and said, God, deliver us. And Yehovah answered and rescued them at the hands of two women. Think about that. So we're in the same position today. And all of us should be praying for rescue from this dangerous world gone mad. The threat of nuclear war is there, and it, it will come at a certain point. Not now, but it will come. At least it certainly is indicated that way. But the fact is that if we're going to survive, we have to put our trust in God Almighty, just as Deborah did. And the big lesson is, our Father will indeed rescue us if we put Him first. That's the big if. Will we put Him first? Will we acknowledge His name? Will we acknowledge who He is? Just as Deborah set the example. Let's go to one final scripture now, John 4 and verse 23. Christ is, is speaking something that we need to take to heart as we close this uh, time together. John 4 and verse 23. <clears throat> Christ says, now this is more appropriate today than the day He uttered these words. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such that worship Him. He calls, he, he 
puts it out there for us. Are you going to worship me or not? Are you going to put me first or not? Are you going to know my name or not? Are you going to recognize who I am fully or not? Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's learn the lessons from the life of Deborah as we prepare for the Passover.